Here I am again. It's been a long time. How long it is exactly, I forget. I do know it has been some time since I felt the comforting sway of the deck beneath my feet. I can see the water from here. And I know that just across the harbour lie the farmlands of my family. Oh, how I long to walk those fields again. But something has changed. None of it looks familiar, and yet I know I've been here before. Where am I again? I moved into this neighborhood in 1972 and I came here and I saw this institution called Snug Harbor and the beautiful buildings and grounds and I found out that the history of it had never been written. So I decided that I would devote myself to doing that. Staten Island has a long history of involvement with sailors and the sailing industry because of our relocation here in the great New York Harbor. The front five buildings that look like Greek temples are the first five National Historic Landmarks ever designated, not only because of their architectural quality, but also because of the history that's attached to the site. Sailor Snug Harbor was founded in 1801. It was created by a man named Robert Richard Randall, who wrote in his will that he wanted his farm to become a home for aged sailors. And at the time, it was extraordinary in many different ways, not only philanthropically, which is perhaps not the way they looked at it then, but he also had such a belief, or whoever wrote his will, and allegedly that's Alexander Hamilton, believed that forever this should continue. He had earned a fortune from the sea, and he wanted to use his money and his farm as a place to take care of old sailors. He had also appointed in his will trustees, men to take care of his estate. He very specifically indicated not names of people, not necessarily just numbers of people, but which positions, in fact, should always govern the trustees of the Sailor Snug Harbor. And they decided that the farm in Manhattan was too valuable and, and the city was growing up around it so quick. By the 1820s and all the people were beginning to move north, and looking for houses, it became clear that maybe it wasn't the right place to have a retreat and a retirement home for mariners. And they examined farms on Long Island and here on Staten Island, and they chose this one where we are today. It belonged to a man named Isaac Houseman. It was 180 acres and they purchased this farm in 1831 and they began to build the buildings about a short time after that. All of this and every dollar that we give to a mariner today can be traced back to the original estate and I'm responsible for making certain that our philanthropy uh, does what it should, that it does it well and we keep in mind the needs of mariners around the country. In fact, it it's, is probably the very first institution that was designed expressly as a retirement home. Mariner life in those days was a hard life. They worked the ships and they didn't necessarily have families in those early days. Because it's such a hard life and being away from home so much. And those men were in particular need, I think, of being here. In those days, sailors did not have uh, the advantages that we have today of better health care and insurance programs. It was a great need for these men to be cared for. A kid could go to sea at the age of 12 or 14 and maybe never make it home. And if you got too old to crew on a ship, you were just fired and would end your life in an alleyway, as a drunk probably. And once Sailor Snug Harbor was created, everything that I've read and notes that they wrote, how important it was that they saw at the end of the line that there would be a place for them 
at Sailor Snug Harbor. And every time mariners would go by, they would see on the lawn in white rocks, Sailor's Snug Harbor. And they would say, that's where I'm going to go. And you could come here. Sailors were admitted to Snug Harbor based on their service under the U.S. flag for a minimum of five years. Their service on a ship could have been under a commercial ship as well as a naval ship. Sailors were also admitted to Snug Harbor without regard for their race, their rank, or national origin. This was an enormous precedent for the 19th century, since many other institutions still discriminated against these same factors. A man might have lost his leg in an accident, or lost his arm, or been blinded, or had rheumatism, or just very old. It could be any of those reasons. It was originally going to be built for about 200 seamen, as I understand. But by the beginning of the 20th century, there were over a thousand seamen there. And almost as many on the staff who lived in the buildings out in the back in the different parts of the property. After Snug Harbor opened in 1833, it continued to expand enormously and another 21 acres were acquired up and through the 1900s. There was the farmers, who, because they grew their own food, the nurses, the doctors, the people that took care of the men, they were called matrons. It was a huge, thriving, self-contained community. There were 55 some buildings. There was a library. There was a hospital. There was a church, and as I understand it, the church was built as a replica of St. Paul's Church in London. All of the buildings were designed by the major architects of New York City. There were fine uh, health facilities, two or three hospitals that had, had been enlarged over the years and a special hospital for tuberculosis patients. You had everything here. You had the farming, you had animals, you had their church, hospital, the morgue. And they were basically like their own little city. So a lot of Snook Harbor stretched out beyond the grounds that are here now, actually many blocks. So it was a very large, prosperous looking and beautiful institution at the year 1900. And the food and Recreation, everything was provided in the high quality. Things began to change, however. In the 1930s, we have the Social Security Act. By the 1950s, we have unions that began to be formed. And so mariners began to have potentially a slightly different life and the issues related to coming to Sailor's Snug Harbor for all of them was not quite the same as it was when it first started in the uh, early 19th century. If Captain Randall had walked around in the 50s, he would have been incredibly disappointed to see what had happened to these fabulous Georgian buildings. And he would have also watched that the numbers of mariners who were staying there through the 50s and the 60s and the 70s diminished dramatically because the maritime industry changed. By the late 1960s, that number was down to well, well below 200. And there was much controversy here because the institution had housed one time 1,000 men. They no longer needed many of the buildings. They proposed to demolish the historic buildings and that caused a great controversy in the community. Citizens that lived nearby and in the island here didn't want to demolish these buildings. Snug Harbor Cultural Center was a new institution that began in 1976 when a group of artists and local activists pleaded with the mayor of New York to get the facility landmarked. At that time, the buildings were in enormous disrepair, roofs were leaking, and many vermin were crawling in and out of the buildings. The cost of operation in New York was just uh, markedly higher than many other places. So a search began to find a, a more suitable site. And so in the 1970s, the trust moved to North Carolina. Mariners who met certain kinds of eligibility requirements were able to, if they wanted to, 
go to Sailor Snug Harbor, except now it was in North Carolina. Snug Harbor was established in the 1970s as a regional arts destination. We have 83 acres, 26 buildings, and our mission is to provide a cultural venue for New York City. We have theater, programming, arts, visual arts, botanic gardens, and horticulture. Every year thousands of people come to Snug Harbor, not just from Staten Island, but also from Manhattan, from Brooklyn, from New Jersey. We've even had tourists come from various countries to visit Snug Harbor. It gets very, very busy. A lot of vehicle traffic, foot traffic, schools coming in, um, just neighborhood people just walking by with their dogs. So it is very busy during the day. We also have theatrical events. We have plays, dance troupes. We have exhibitions of art. We have music. We have weddings. We have so much going on here. So many different museums and children's events and concerts. There's something going on almost every night here and it's an amazing place to visit at any time. Snug Harbor is almost as rich in rumors of hauntings as it is in maritime history. For years, stories of ghostly sightings on the grounds, as well as strange occurrences in many of these old buildings, have been reported again and again by local Staten Islanders. As with every location, we started off by researching the history of the location. We met with some of the employees, talked to them, gathered their stories, and from everything we heard, we decided that it was definitely worth investigating. Because there were so many claims, we wanted to find out for ourselves if we could find any evidence of paranormal activity. I hear these stories sometimes from the security guards that work here, the rangers, sometimes from the cleaning crew, and a lot of times just from people who've come to Snug Harbor and who know the stories and the history and the background. When I first started here, so here we go with the ghost stories, I said, oh, okay. Yeah, whatever. At Snug Harbor, we've heard lots of different types of paranormal activity being reported. Everything from a woman in white being seen, doors closing on their own, voices being heard. There are many times I've saw things in different places, out on the grounds, in the other buildings. Definitely at night after 7 o'clock is when usually we'll see things going on, hear things going on. And from 7 o'clock up until I would say the following morning when the place would open, say 7 in the morning. It's been many times in different areas that I've heard voices and whispers in the hallways. Hey, you know what? I experienced the same thing. Um, that's why I kind of figured, hey, all right, that's, that's really weird. Something's got to be going on. I find it interesting. I don't dismiss it in, in any way. I've actually never had a paranormal experience yet at Snug Harbor, and I'm hoping for one just to see what it's like. It's not something that I give a lot of credence to, but if there were things to help investigate that or prove that, that's fine. I guarantee you'll see something. I guarantee you. Because every time I went there, it got to the point where you look, you see it, okay, and you just kept going. Our South Meadow used to be where the sanitarium was, which is the hospital. The hospital itself had to be taken down. There has been rumors of what could be a person floating across the lawn. Burger alarms go off, fire alarms go off, and you have to trip those things. I've had a lot of experiences on the grounds here, more so than I've ever had in another location. We've heard lots of stories. Um, Lots of stories of kinetic activity, furniture moving, the doors won't stay locked. Lights going on, noises. Uh, it really runs the whole gamut of paranormal activity there. And everybody has different stories because different departments work in different parts of this facility. So I'm sure they have different, you know, different experiences. Working closely with the rangers and other workers and maintenance men, contractors, you go into the basements, you go into the attics, you go into the hallways, and there was a lot of unexplained things going on. I'm usually always thinking, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Um, but my working here, there definitely was some instances here where it makes me, you know, somewhat believe that it's, it's been very possible. It's not something that I always look for, and it's not something that I will just automatically just say it's paranormal activity. I will measure and see what's going on and then come to my own conclusions. I don't yell ghost all at once. 
There were so many things that happened. I, I, I couldn't explain just how many times it happened, uh, the things you see. People would have to be here to really believe. I never really believed in ghosts until I got to Snug Harbor. I am a believer now. Reports are varied, from wandering apparitions walking the night to disembodied voices echoing in empty buildings. Now the only way to know for certain what's really going on here is to conduct a full investigation. This way we'll find out if there's any truth to these rumors or if they're just the byproducts of overactive imaginations. What manner of sailor are these? I don't recognize the uniforms. They're unlike any I've ever encountered. Strange. They don't appear to be aged or decrepit. What is their purpose here? It started with a few buildings. There were 37 seamen who came at the beginning. They lived in the first building. There was only one building in the very first few years. There were four men in each room, each a bed in each corner of the room. And downstairs was the chapel, the dining room, the kitchen, and the offices. But the institution expanded rapidly. So uh, five years later, they built the second building. And there, uh, most of the rooms had two men on both the first floor, the second floor, and the third floor. All five of those that faced the water along the front, each of those was a dormitory. When you walk into Sea Hall, if you look up at the ceiling, you'll see a mural, and it's all based on being a sailor and living on the ocean. There's a weather vane, and when the wind blows it, it makes this creaking sound like a boat. The reason why it's there is because when the sailors would sleep there, this would be the first time they would have a bed. And this sound was very soothing to them because it reminded them of the sounds of a boat. I think it, it has always been quite evident that seamen like to be around seamen. Seamen sometimes are, are a little different than other folks. They're loners, their life has been difficult. Um, so they take comfort being in the presence of others who understand their way of life and understand what they've been through. Well, I remember when the sailors were there. That's how far back I go. I remember the snugs being there. Uh, they had it good. The old sailors didn't think of themselves as being poor by any means, and this institution was not like a poor farm. This was a very elite lifestyle. Each man uh, was given a suit of clothes, a new suit of clothes in the fall and in the summer from Brooks Brothers, so they had the latest medical care and the latest recreational facilities and everything. It was a wonderful place. It was uh, a very well-endowed institution, one of the richest and the most prestigious benevolent institutions in all of America. I say 99% of them were happy. They had a place to eat, they had a place to sleep, they were taken care of. One of the great things about Snug Harbor was that the, all the residents um, were treated equally regardless of what rank they held on ship. They loved talking to one another and being a type of family here together. Of course, uh, men like to complain anyway, and that's one of the recreations, I think, of an old folks' home. <laughs> Dear sir, I ask this question. Why and what reason us men can't have baked beans for Saturday dinner instead of pig meat? Every man in the harbor is craving for baked beans. The best meal that is put on the table and the cheapest, baked beans and brown bread. Signed, Anonymous. 
Many sailors were allowed to make a variety of crafts here on the site. They made baskets, they made macrame, as well as other things that they brought into the city to sell. This created extra income for them, which unfortunately they were using for the purchase of tobacco and alcohol, which was not permitted during temperance movements of the 19th century. There was a list of rules that the inmates had to follow. Non-compliance would result in punishment, also known as being tabooed. These restrictions led to a number of punishments that were imposed on sailors who broke these rules. Where they may be forbidden to earn extra money, leave the grounds for weeks or months at a time, or in some cases, offenses could result in expulsion from the institution. They weren't supposed to drink. That was one of the clauses or whatever you want to call it. But uh, Charlie Leedy's was very well famous. You, you could always find a bunch of the snugs in there. They were amazing, amazing, amazing people. And they all dressed up with suit and ties and hats. Some, some would have flannel shirts with canes. Some guys had wooden legs. So when the men came here, at first they expected them to be teetotalers and, to, and they found them, you know, sneaking out over the fence at night and coming home drunk as skunks. I'd never seen a snug climb over the wall, but they said, over the wall Harry, there was a guy named, he was a snug over the wall Harry, he used to climb over the whole wall. They were all major, major drinkers. Unfortunately, they were alcoholics, but they were, they were great guys. So today the C building is actually uh, the center of our campus. It's mostly our galleries. We have arts, antiquities in there, paintings. We hold a lot of special events in the C building. Some of the most interesting artifacts here in Main Hall Building C are located in the attic. These include graffiti by sailors, drawings of ships, drawings of each other, as well as drawings of women and other things that sailors would have had in their dreams. You hear all kinds of noises in these buildings. You know, you think the building was settling, but some of them you have footsteps. Definitely footsteps. I would be in the gallery by myself and actually upstairs hear people walking around. It sounds like people running around upstairs. Um, they're going up to check as part of security. You find out finding there's nobody there. A couple of steps, then stop. A couple of more steps, then stop. Then a jump, and then a couple of more steps. Like somebody actually walking around up there. You could feel the footsteps behind you. It sounds like someone's closing doors things like that, but no one's up there and they'll hear these sounds. Door slamming right behind us while we were like two feet away from the door. And I don't mean a nice gentle little push shove, I mean like slam. Door slammed. Happens all over the site. It sounds as if you could think it's like a mouse. I mean, it's, it's, you, somebody's there. I heard men's voices. I felt as though something or someone was trying to get my attention. I couldn't believe it. To this day, I still don't believe it. When I used to go home and tell my wife, she used to look at me and say, yeah, okay, you know. But it was true. Doors, after being closed, creaking open, you close them again to lock them, and for some reason they would be open again after it was just locked. And then you close it again, maybe about three or four times, and next thing you know, you're like, all right, well, whatever it is, I'll just leave it where it is and <laughs> go on to my next job. And they had a couple of young college girls there, very well endowed. Every time she bends over, you hear tapping. Those two young ladies are exciting the boys upstairs, and sure enough, here goes, they bent over and here they start tapping again. I'm the director of the Noble Maritime Collection, which is a museum and study center dedicated to the work of John Noble and the history of Sailor's Snug Harbor. I 
was hired by the Noble family in 1984 to oversee John Noble's estate. And then in 1992, we moved the museum from his home on Richmond Terrace to this building, Building D at Snug Harbor. This building was uh, constructed in 1841 and opened in 1844 as a dormitory for mariners. It had a chapel in this room actually where we're standing there was a small chapel. There were congregation rooms where they could, you know, be together and they would have activities as well. But that's a place to show you uh, how they lived as far as their room, their bedding, and what uniform they wore. What is now the Noble Maritime Museum used to be a empty building that used to give everybody the creeps. A couple of them were afraid to go in there. A lot of them were afraid to go in at night in the building. I had son Nick that worked here. He'd say the same thing. He worked that night and he said, Dad, this place is spooky. You know, it happens, you know, people get scared. Yes, I have heard many rumors and yes, I do believe that there's a um, ghostly presence within this building. You know, I've been frightened by it and so have a couple of other people. They had, I remember two wheelchairs from probably about 1900. Still good. Just sitting there. And it's, it's all kinds of stuff you wouldn't believe was in there. The Noble Maritime Museum actually has a lot of the artifacts that belonged to the sailors while they lived at Snug Harbor. And one of the theories is that when a person passes on, their spiritual energy could be passed on to these objects, objects that meant something to them in life. And since these objects are still in the Maritime Museum, it leads us to believe that the museum is haunted. In theory, not only can objects sometimes retain a spiritual attachment, they can also be used to spark paranormal activity. Over the years, about in this building, about four men shared a room at any time. So you're looking at over the course of 150 years or so, how many people came into this room, lived here, and, and spent their final days. The alcohol and cigarettes are trigger objects. And uh, I'm using those to hopefully entice uh, a spirit, if there is one here, with uh, this is something they would have enjoyed uh, during their life, and it might make them more receptive to uh, to me being in this room. I know uh, a lot of you old sailors were fond of your alcohol and tobacco, so we share that in common. While well, you were in the Navy, just a regular merchant vessel. Can you tell me what life was like at Snug Harbor? I do have to say though, I have to give you credit for living on a ship at sea for months or years at a time because uh, I don't think I could do it. Feel free to share any stories you want. I'm here to listen. Do you have a little drink with you? I know a lot of the governors frowned upon you guys actually drinking, but I won't taboo you. Now it's time to review some audio and see if I actually caught any EVPs, if there are any responses to my questions. You'd be walking down the hyphen, you see this bluish gray haze coming, uh, coming towards you. Never bother you, and you just kept on walking or floating. And then that hyphen, they used to all line up. And then C building, that's what he used to eat. It was a maintenance guy. He was mopping the floor and, uh, in between H and G building. Where he was mopped, the wet floor, there were footprints. There's nobody there, just him. He picked up his mop and his pair and said, bye. Now the rumors we've heard about this particular location is that uh, footsteps were seen as a janitor was mopping the floor. Uh, the floor was wet, footsteps appeared, nobody made them. Whereas the human eye can only detect a certain range of light waves, the full spectrum camera can see from infrared all the way through the ultraviolet. 
Now I wanted to use this camera to try and verify some of the reports we heard about in the hyphen. All right, I've been in the hyphen for some time now, and as of yet, I haven't found any evidence of uh, mysterious footprints or mists or anything of that type. Now, paranormal investigation is about collecting data, and I think we have to expand our search. I'm gonna go grab Chris, and we're gonna continue to search Sea Hall to see if we can't find any more. No matter how many rumors or eyewitness accounts you've heard, it does not guarantee activity at a location. There's been many stories about one particular sailor who is actually a very nice ghost here. He's, uh, his name is Old Salty, and he has helped many people, especially tourists, who are lost try to find places to get to the Chinese Scholar's Garden or to the Music Hall. And each time they, say, they want to say thank you to that nice old man, but there was never a nice old man around. You're going up, we're going up Cottage Row, and all of a sudden we see this guy walk across over to the greenhouse. We go running around all over the greenhouse trying to find this guy, can't find him. Did you see that? I didn't see anything. Pop, you see anything? Nope, I didn't see nothing. Kept going. We have an LA on campus. What that is is a tunnel made out of leaves. And every once in a while, you'll see someone at the end of the tunnel Looks like he's smoking a pipe. When you get down to the end of the tunnel where he is, he disappears. If in fact Old Salty does exist, what's well, a good chance his remains are buried at Monkey Hill, the nearby cemetery. Behind St. Peter's High School is a place called Monkey Hill. It's a, it's a steep, it's a steep hill. That's where the snugs are buried. The name Monkey Hill comes from a whaling term derived from monkey line. That's the term they used for the rope that was tied to the sailors who went overboard and began cutting up the freshly harpooned whales. They say there are 10,000 men buried in the graveyard. You know, that's a lot. For many, we have their death certificates, and we also still operate the cemetery. We don't know a lot about the cemetery. It's one of the things that we're hoping to, um, to look into. And the gravestones are here on the property, but you can't see them in the public. They're, they were taken away be, to prevent vandalism of them, but they are here. From what we know at this particular point, and this is not absolute, that um, bodies were buried one on top of the other, and as time has gone on, they've sunk. There are very, very few um, nameplates that are left, but we're hoping in this next year to see what we can do to find out um, and again, to treat with respect um, the individuals that are buried there and that are buried and were part of Sailor Snug Harbor. I miss my brother. I know the sea took him long ago. She took many who were near to me. I miss them all. I miss the camaraderie, the brotherhood. I'm happy that many were able to find solace here. But where are they now? I sense they're nearby, but can't seem to find them. What? <sighs> Blasted gates! I can't seem to get past them. They isolate me from those who I would call friend. But wait. There is another here. I feel her isolation as well. 
Maybe she can help me remember. It's been said that one of the most active sites on the entire grounds is the matron's house. The matron's cottage was originally known as the chief steward's residence when it was built in 1845. It was split up into two separate living quarters, one for the steward and his family. At the time, the steward's wife was in charge of the workers. The other apartment housed the single female employees. When the steward moved to the bigger house in 1880, it was thereafter called the matron's house. The matron's house was where the laundry girls lived, and the matron would watch over these girls. I'd say the matron's house definitely has activity in it. That place you don't want to go in at nighttime. You would see a light lit up in a room. Now you know, the latest of people we used to let them stay here was 10. Some stayed to 11. But this was like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I go into the matron's house and I go upstairs. I knock on the door, knock on the door, there's nobody answering. So I put the key in, I open the door, and all the lights were out. Now I know the lights were lit. One of my first experiences on the grounds was during a ghost tour uh, where I saw a shadow in the matron's house and it was just black. It was blacker than the shadows around it and I backed out of the room. I didn't want to turn my back to it. During the historical hauntings event I was in the matron's house. I felt a cold chill in the air and then I looked up and saw the train of a dress float past. Everyone was downstairs. There was no one upstairs. To me, that was the matron, and she was watching us. One time when we were in the matron's house, we were hearing voices coming from the third floor. When we went up to check, there was no one there. And when we came back down, we were still able to hear the voices. The first time we investigated the matron's house, Laura and I were walking up the stairs, and we distinctly heard two women speaking to each other when we were the only two people in the house. We had our K2 meter with us, and the only real hits we got off of it was when I asked a question. So rumors started spreading around Snug Harbor that the matron had a thing for me, um, because it really only responded with hits when I asked a question and never liked when Laura asked a question. I felt a pressure on my lips, almost as if someone was going like this, probably to keep me from talking. I actually saw a shadow that seemed to come up the stairs to the area that we were in. It's a, we always get an eerie feeling in the building, almost as if someone doesn't want us there. In the matron's house, um, I usually feel very un, uneasy. You know, I'm the one of the group who never feels anything, never sees anything, never experiences anything. But for some reason, in the matron's house, it's just my gut feeling is to just leave. We've investigated the matron's house several times, and we've come away with a lot of interesting things. So I want you to listen to this clip and see what you hear. Excuse me, Moss, you play? One of the guys that we were with said, excuse me, Moss, see vous play, for whatever reason. And then after that, we hear what sounds to be get out. Excuse me, Moss, you play? Excuse me, Moss, you play? I was in one of the upstairs bedrooms and I took some photos and one of them looked like I had a little boy in the window. So naturally you can get reflections in bedrooms with windows so I had to take several and none of them came out with anything similar to that. I tried to recreate the picture. I stood in the same spot and then I stood in different positions and I still got nothing. Unaware of its history or rumors, we brought our psychic, Lisa Ann, in to see if she could make any connections. Almost immediately, Lisa Ann began to pick up on what she calls psychic impressions. What is the difference between an impression and a spirit? It's almost like watching a movie over and over. So I'm not actually communicating with anybody or communicating with a spirit. I'm just picking up what's happened here. Then other times there's actually spirits that will talk or show me things or things like that. So this house, I'm not feeling any spirits. I'm just seeing different flashes of things. I just keep seeing this woman who is in probably like her early 30s, long dress on, very pretty, 
And I just, I'm not sure if she lived here though. She might have like worked here or helped out here, but I keep seeing her with the man in the wheelchair, but he's not obviously upstairs, he's downstairs. And I feel like she offered like comfort to people or she was like almost like a therapist to people. You know what I mean? Like people felt very comfortable with her. But this room, it's very hot on this side of the house. And I don't know why, I just keep feeling like someone that lived in this house had a fever or something, like died of some kind of a fever. All of a sudden I feel like really flushed and sick. We often use psychics on our investigations. They give us an insight into where and why some of this activity may be occurring. I'm just very drawn to all the windows and I just feel really sad when I'm looking out the window. I'm almost like a depressed feeling and I keep connecting with that girl again. I just feel like she was in love with someone that went away and either died or never came back. And I feel like because of that, she like dedicated her life to helping people. But all the windows in this house, I just feel like I'm just like looking out the window, just really sad and knowing that I'm not gonna see that person again. There's a story often told about the Mansion's house. A story that involves a murder. So the story that the rangers told us when we first had come here was that the matron who worked in the house had a disabled child and she would take him out during the day on the grounds but when she had to go to work she couldn't take him out so she would bring him down to the basement and she would lock him in a cage and chain him to the wall. She was having an affair with one of the doctors and she had an illegitimate child who was developmentally disabled. She was hiding the child from either the Snuggies or from the administration. She would let him out. She would keep him in the room basically locked up. And over the course of time, I guess he had gotten frustrated to a point where he turned on her. And he stabbed her with scissors. She was murdered in the house and her spirit walks around the house and around the area. As with any urban legend, there are variations of the story depending on who's telling it. As these stories get passed down from person to person over the years, sometimes little details are changed, facts are altered. As a result of these changes, it becomes very hard and sometimes nearly impossible to verify the facts and find out the truth. There was another version that we heard, that there was a young student who fell in love with the matron. He was supposed to be mentally challenged. And she rejected his advances. And he had, she had him tied up or chained up and they say that he killed her. And legend has it that the other residents of Snug Harbor eventually found him and lynched him on a tree out behind the matron's house. I never encountered any of that information. Of course, my documentation was not primarily interviews, but my documentation was written records. When you have so many people who were residents, and you have so many people who work there, there have to be all kinds of stories and whether or not how you know whether the stories are true we can only look at to see what we have because no one knows i don't believe a word of the rumors the woman that lived here was um emotionally disconnected because her heart was broken but she was not a vicious person and she would have never harmed a child investigations we always carry around a handheld uh, digital camcorder uh, just to document any personal experiences we may have. Um, we have the infrared emitter on it so we can see in complete darkness. Um, we set up stationary cameras in different rooms just to capture over time but we always want to keep one of these with the investigators in case anything happens so we can document it as it's happening. This is a uh, K2 meter. Um, it comes in really handy in uh, EVP sessions as a visual tool, just for simple yes or no questions. My name is Laura, and with me I have my friends Jason and Jimmy, and we would like to talk to you. We have over on the shelf two devices, one with a green light and one with a red light. If you want, you can go over to them, and you can touch them, you can speak into them. Is there a young boy here? Can you make a noise for us, knock on a piece of wood or one of the pipes? Just let us know that you're here and that you understand us.
I think it's important with a place like Snug Harbor and any other location to come back multiple times because you can't make an accurate assessment about whether or not a place is haunted in one visit. If something's going to happen, it's going to happen. We can't force it. While we were investigating the matron's house, we caught some footsteps coming up the stairs. All of the investigators were sitting in the hallway, we were all accounted for. Watch this clip and see what you hear. I heard that. Hello? What is that? Can you hear where that's coming from, Jim? It sounds like it's yeah. come, coming from the stairwell. When we were in the matron's house in the top floor, the equipment kind of started bugging out on us. Are there any spirits here with us tonight? Mm -hmm. Now what energy is holding up that meter right now? Could it be the booster? No, no it's different. <laughs> the natural EMF detector and the K2 meter went off, which didn't make any sense to me because one does AC and one does DC. Now, for the camera, what could make it act like that? Uh, a spirit. <laughs> you know, I really can't explain what happened. All I know is it wasn't mechanical. The camera battery drained for no reason. Whoa, where'd the battery for this thing go? Battery's dead, I have like 40 minutes left. There's been many rumors and hearsay about murders happening here at Snug Harbor. And of course they get exaggerated with time. But we do have an article from the New York Times, February 1st, 1863, that recalls a real murder that did happen here. Murder at Snug Harbor. At nine o'clock yesterday morning, a most atrocious homicide was committed at the sailor Snug Harbor, Staten Island, under the following circumstances. The chaplain of the institution, Reverend Robert A. Quinn, had been holding religious services in the sailor's chapel and was on his return home when a sailor named Herman Ingalls, who was standing near the corner of the main building, confronted him saying, You'll expose me. I know you will. If you live. And immediately drew from his breast pocket a double-barreled pistol and fired at Mr. Quinn. The ball entered his left breast immediately under the heart and after reeling for a few seconds, Mr. Quinn dropped dead, exclaiming, I'm shot, I'm shot. The sailor then turned around, placed the pistol close to the side of his own head, discharged the remaining barrel, and fell. The shot tore away his entire lower jaw. During our research, we were actually able to verify that a murder took place outside, so Brooke and I thought it would be a good place to investigate. The spirit box is a modified AM FM radio and what it does is it continuously scans through the radio stations and it actually is supposed to help spirits talk to us in real time. I'm very open minded to trying a lot of different equipment because there's a lot that we don't know yet about the paranormal and the only way we are going to learn is by trial and error and by experimenting with different pieces of equipment. Are you here with us Reverend or Herman Ingalls? I heard Ingalls too. I heard Ingalls. Ingalls, are you here with us? Can you say your name for me again? Do you want to talk to us? Why did you shoot the Reverend and then yourself? Also receive a reason. It said it. It said it. Did you get that? When I heard respect come out of the spirit box, I got goose pimples. When I heard change communication come through the spirit box, I thought we should listen and try another method. I'm very skeptical about the spirit box. I kind of feel like it's the digital version of a Ouija board and because there's so many different ambient noises, I don't know if I believe it. I believe that the reason why there may be spirit activity in this particular location is because of a murder-suicide. And one of the things that I truly believe in that if there's gonna be a haunting, 
that it would be at a location where something happened suddenly or tragically. Unfortunate events have transpired here from time to time. Accidents, attempted mutinies, brawls, and even murder. At sea, as well as on land, such things do happen. But there are consequences. Men require rules to anchor their behavior, and without those rules and an officer to guide them, one can go astray. I myself am adrift. I seek the counsel of such a man. Most active buildings were, when I was here, was the music hall, e-building, and the governor's house. The building where we're filming today was called the Chief Steward's House. And the Chief Steward was the man that took care of all the supplies that were needed by the institution. And the executive director, who was called the governor, he lived in an even bigger house. His house was built about 1842. It, it was demolished 100 years later. And this house was built around 1870, I think, 1880. And then the governor, later in time, the governor lived in this house. So it's not entirely inaccurate to call this the governor's house, but it was built for another purpose originally. Some of the governors were very well liked and some of them were not as well liked. One of the most well-known governors of Snoke Harbor was Thomas Melville, brother of Herman, most famous as the author of Moby Dick. Herman Melville often visited sailors Snug Harbor. He loved to talk to the old sailors about their life. And it is believed that he gathered some of his stories that inspired such 19th century novels as Moby Dick. It has been written by historians that Governor Thomas Melville was an iron-fisted ruler. Governor Melville was a strict disciplinarian. He coined the term taboo and frequently punished the violators of the rules. It is well known that Captain Thomas Melville specifically requested his office be located at the front of Main Hall Building C. This way, he could look out the window and view the North Gate. If a sailor were to arrive in a drunken state or a disorderly state, he would know immediately. June 16th, 1870, William Cummins came in drunk at 6.30 a.m., tabooed one month. He also wanted the old sailors to work the grounds without pay. All these things made him widely unpopular with the men. There was always complaints, but I would say by and large, the leadership was good here. Captain Thomas Felville was highly regarded by the trustees of Sailor's Snug Harbor due to his expansion of the property and his capital projects to improve the site as well as construct new buildings that benefited the sailors. He served as governor from 1867 to 1884. I can't stress enough the amount of personal experiences that we had at the governor's house. It was unlike any other place that we've investigated before. Every night I came to work, I said, I wonder what I'm going to see tonight. We had heard stories of water turning on and off, footsteps on the stairs. I had a few personal experiences there. I heard some voices at a couple of points during the night. Uh, at one point I saw a very distinct shadow figure as well. Weird stuff went in there. Lights going on, noises, uh, you hear things. Sometimes you, you swear you hear people talking. I was in the governor's house with a friend of mine taking some pictures. We actually heard a female voice upstairs laughing. <laughs> you hear that? Hello? Anybody up there? There was nobody in that house. After that happened, I had a very heaviness on my chest. I had a hard time breathing and a very, a very uneasiness that I had to get out of the house. When you hear voices sometimes, you say, eh, it's got to be my imagination. But then when you hear it quite often, it's not your imagination anymore. I'm not the type to imagine those things. Like I said, it never bothered me. On the second floor, I felt a sudden coolness on my cheek, almost as if someone was touching me like this. 
It was very creepy. There was a definite feeling of, of heaviness and that we were being watched. It was just a very unwelcoming feeling. Um, and just our skin was crawling the whole time, almost like there was like an electric charge on us. It seems to be on the second floor of the governor's house. There were many, as where doors would be, they would close it, they would also open on their own. Sean and I went upstairs to investigate the claim of activity that the door opens and closes on its own. While we were in there, we did a K2 sweep, and after I asked some questions, the K2 meter started going off right by the doorknob. If you're able to open the door, can you please do so now? It's hard to believe ghost stories, you know, you see it on TV and stuff like that, but when it actually happens. You know, you tell people, they look at you like, you're yeah, okay, is he on something or is he nuts? At first, like I said, I thought they were setting me up. I said, ah, this is, this is an initiation thing. It's okay, I'll go along with it, you know, but it wasn't. They were telling me stories, yeah, right, sure, mm-hmm. I started working there. I believe anything they tell me. We investigate as much as we can two or three times. You can't get these things uh, to come out on command. We're going to try the laser experiment. It's a regular typical laser with a star cap on it. The theory is you break any of the pixels and you still detect, detect it with the laser. So you can adjust the pixels. One question, are spirits supposed to be able to be invisible yet still have a physical manifestation? You know, nobody really knows. I mean, there's so many different theories out there that they can come in and out of this dimension, they can be solid appearing, they can be transparent. We're just using any technology we can to try and detect that, but you know, it's all theory right now. Can you give us a sign of your presence by Copying my knocks. Sometimes in these places we'll hear noises. Often they can be explained. Sometimes there is no explanation. While reviewing the footage, I came across a clip of a door slam approximately about 3 o'clock in the morning when no one was in the building. I looked at the video and no one was in there from an hour before and until about a half hour after. I'm not sure what it is, but there's definitely things going on here at Snug Harbor. I heard another story about a woman uh, that walks around, an older woman walking around with a white dress around the cottages looking for something. The woman in white is a common phenomenon that's often associated with tragic events. We've heard a lot of stories about a woman in white seen on the third floor. Or she'll be walking through the Rose Garden, which is behind the governor's house. One of the stories we heard is that the woman had a stillborn child and now she roams the grounds mourning the baby's death. I've seen things that I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm getting old, I, I must be going nuts, you know, senile, whatever. But other guys, people, other people, other guys have seen it. And he was telling me about a woman in white that would cross in between the cottages. People would be coming into weddings or functions. Oh, thank the young lady in the white dress down in the, at the corner. We asked her, we stopped and asked her where the great hall was, and they pointed. And I say, okay, Pop, whatever you say. I'm saying to myself, my God. A woman in white? Go down here? Nothing. But this happened three or four times, so if in a couple of weeks, in the summertime, 
And standing by the greenhouse, my wife saw uh, a figure of a woman. And as I turned on my left side, I saw a woman. Um, she was a little bit taller than me, about a head taller than me, very thin. But the thing that was very strange and really startled me is I saw the greenhouse um, through her. And I was down by the glass house here where the pond is, and lo and behold, I saw a woman in white, and I thought they set me up. There was nobody there. And I said, oh my God. Yeah, uh, we've had incidents, especially on the 4 to 12 shift at nighttime. Doing a tour uh, with my partner, driving down Cottage Road from the South Meadow. Um, and there was an elderly woman in a white gown, basically down to her ankle. So we shined a spotlight on her and she continued to walk to the back of cottage number three. And she disappeared behind the cottage. Checked the cottage, it was empty. Checked all around the whole vicinity and it was empty. Post one to post seven. Can you see if she's on the other side of the cottage? There was no glowing. There was no nothing. That's when I thought they were setting me up because they got a girl in here, they put on a white dress, and they're walking through. I said, okay. But when I got there, there was nobody there. There's no way you could hide back there. That woman in white is real. What torment is this? Finally, I find someone here, but she pays me no heed. I see the sorrow in her soul. It reflects my own, and yet she must complete her journey on her own. My path leads elsewhere. I need a distraction, something to lift my spirits. I see no tavern nearby. But I seem to recall another place of merriment, where perhaps I can find a kindred spirit. As part of the expansion of Snug Harbor, the Music Hall was constructed in 1893. The Music Hall is known as being the second oldest music hall in New York City after Carnegie Hall. The Music Hall featured performances for the sailors exclusively of vaudeville as well as opera and what's most fascinating is that the first films by Thomas Edison on the kinetoscope were projected in the Music Hall. Some of the rumors about the Music Hall is that Robert Randall actually sits up in the balcony and watches the plays as they go on. Before they renovated the Music Hall, you would hear sometimes music coming in. That's another place where you go in there, you hear the noises, you swear somebody's up in a balcony moving them chairs. And of course you think to yourself, it could be just the settling of an old building, but then you start to analyze and you start listening and say, no, no, that sounds like somebody moving a chair. That sounds like somebody sitting down or, or getting up in a chair flopping behind it. Downstairs or downstairs underneath the stage, you'd swear there were people down there and uh, nobody there, nobody there. There'd be sounds or just, just weird things that are out of the ordinary. It would be happening. You'd be up at the stage checking, making sure everything's there said. All of a sudden, the door up in the balcony would close or open. Yeah, I've heard there's ghosts in the music hall, uh, in particular, a lady in a white dress. She goes on the balcony and she opens and closes the doors. A woman in white, who's seen a lot around campus, will dance across the stage or walk across the stage, depending on her mood. It's rumored that she's actually the wife of the doctor who had the affair with the matron. And when she found out that he was having the affair, she actually hung herself from the rafters here. Christy and I were going up here to go upstairs to look at the catwalk. And as we were right by the stairs, we heard a squeak. So both of us turned and looked at this door because we thought somebody opened the door. Mm -hmm. So she's like, did you hear that? I said, yeah, you know, it sounded like a door. That first door, it was that door, that, that squeak. So apparently Left. it sounded like that door opened and then closed. Shut. Yeah. And that's what happened last time we were here. We did EVP sessions, although we didn't get anything. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's nothing there, so we're going to go ahead and try again. 
Captain Randall, are you here? What year is it? Is there anybody here that wishes to communicate with us? While we were investigating in the music hall, the other team went upstairs. I waited um, downstairs on the stage. Um, I saw lights, so on the wall high up to the ceiling. Um, I didn't know what they were, so I waited for everybody to come back down. I don't, I'm not sure where, where you guys, but I knew you were on your way down. Yeah. I don't know where exactly you were. Okay. But a light went right across that middle um, chandelier. Yeah, that one. Wanna go there again? I just want to see, I'm just going to put it um, down there and see if you see a light. I'll sit here and see if I see the light. All right. I think it was uh, our flashlight, but you could check again. You guys were already coming down? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, from here? What? From here, I think. Well, it's not going anywhere. Yeah, it's just a hole. So I tried to recreate those lights. Couldn't do it. It wasn't the flashlights. I just don't know what it was. Then at times it got to the point when I had a new range, I had to go with them because, you know, they get a little scared. And we went to them, they heard a noise. I said, pay no attention to it. It's when you see things flying in the air like you see on television, quit the job. And there's also a heckler up in the balcony. I don't know if he's with Robert Randall or not, but he throws stuff from the balcony and tries to hit the people on the stage. I've had screws thrown at me, and not just screws, like if you're in a construction set, the screws are drop and you, there's a certain volume to it. The screws have direction. Um, I've had uh, other colleagues, other security officers, tell me that they've had water bottles from the balcony thrown at them. And actually, we kind of had something happen earlier this evening. We were standing here, and Greg um, saw a shadow moving over there. We can try to figure out where the shadow comes from, so we were wondering if it was something crossing up the light up there. So we were trying to debunk that, but we really couldn't figure it out. We saw a shadow move across the doors on the first floor. It was not us. We were not in front of that light, and we cannot recreate it ourselves. We do not know what made that shadow. As I said, the lights are pretty high in here. In order to recreate that, we'd have to be at least maybe 50 feet up in the air. We have a fire system here. They used to go off regular. The fire alarm goes off if something is tripped. Now, who's here? Yeah, but it would go off and it was getting to be on a regular basis. And I said, you know, it's getting ridiculous. You gotta direct the fire department where you are, shine the light and everything. They come down, they said, what's going on? I said, nothing. I said, it went off in this building. I was in the building, there's no smoke, no fire, no nothing. And they used to say, Joe, we're sleeping, Joe. You're coming here, and there's no fires. I said, all right, next time I light a match. <laughs> Looking for heat signatures, hot or cold, in the uh, room with the thermal. It's a flare. It can uh, go from 40 degrees to 220. Now you see my handprint? Even though my hand's no longer there, the temperature from my hand was imprinted on the chair. And I'll search the whole area to see if there's any heat signatures that shouldn't be there. I took the thermal onto the second floor balcony because we've heard of many rumors of activity going on up there. Cold spots are created by an entity drawing energy from the surrounding atmosphere, so it's making a cold spot where that is being taken from. 99% of the things we come across can be explained, but we're always looking for that 1% and that can't be. This is a real-time EVP unit. I could set it to one second to three second delay so that I can hear myself ask the question and then I could actually hear a response. What's really good about this is if I get an answer, say, uh, I see what is your name, and I get Henry, I could actually conduct a conversation with Henry. Robert Randall, are you here with us? So if there's something you want to say, you can talk into this device and I will hear you.
Is there anyone here with us? I'm not here to harm you. I'm just here to communicate with you. Was this a place that you loved? Robert Randall, are you here with us? We're looking for Captain Randall. Captain Randall, are you here? I hear the voices calling out into the darkness. Calling out to something unseen. Despite my salutations, I remain alone. What is happening? Why do these voices haunt me so? Wait. Who am I? What year is this? Those I've looked for? The matron? She's not here. She's dead. The governor's house? Empty? All the sailors gone? What manner of hell is this, where I go unseen and unheard, where every step I take leads me to the unavoidable realization that I am dead? I know Robert Randall founded Snug Harbor, and in fact, he's still buried on the grounds. As best as I can tell, he was the son of someone who had a great deal of influence on early America and early New York City, and that's Captain Thomas Randall. People still report seeing the spirit of Captain Randall walking around on the campus. It's true what they say about people coming back. They got to be coming back. There's a reason why they're coming back. Maybe they just want to make sure the place is still here. We've heard rumors that he still haunts the location, but we haven't really had any specific experiences to back up those rumors yet. But I would say there was like a certain time frame of the month where we would say, oh, Robert Randall's making his rounds again. Maybe he's checking on the place. Maybe he likes, so far he must like what he sees. I don't know. Walking through what we call the bum boat in the back in between the buildings here, there was somebody standing there. Hey, you. And I'm yelling, hey, come here, come here. And he's standing there, he's not paying attention to him. I walked up there and there was nobody there. That could have been Robert Randall too. I know it was a man, definitely was a man. But by the time I got close enough to really see it, it was gone. That was the first time, you know, when you really feel something, it really shook me up. And I don't get shook up like that. And, and, and it shook me up. Robert Randall, was originally buried in Manhattan and they moved his body to Snug Harbor and the rumor has it that he wasn't happy with that and so he tends to walk about campus and look across the water to see where he was originally buried. Sure, uh, Robert Richard Randall's statue and spirit may be pointing towards Manhattan, but I'm convinced his heart is here right on Staten Island at Snug Harbor, because based on all the stories I've heard about the other ghosts and spirits and paranormal activity that's here, um, why would he want to leave such a uh, party, such an exciting place? This is Sean and Brooke at the Obelisk outside where Robert Randall is buried. Robert Randall, are you at rest? Spirit is, uh, is something uh, nobody understands yet. Nobody could say that he understands spirit 100%. So we try to go to these places to find out about spirit, to learn more about spirit, and to learn more about something that we, uh, as a human we do not understand, something not logical. Are you pleased with what they did after you died? Mr. Randall, a lot of people uh, who love you moved out of this place. Are you sad they closed this place? Do you ever visit the new facility in North Carolina? Oh. 
Look at this. What? It's moved. It moved? Yeah. Hmm. Are you happy that you bury it right here? In this ground? Do you know how happy you've made all of the sailors that stay here? The waters are calm and the horizon is clear. I remember everything now. My family, our fortune and the promise of a better life. My life was good, better than most. The sea was most generous to my family. Not all sailors were so fortunate. That which comes from the sea, let's return to the sea. I used to dream about what those words could mean. With my passing, my dream has been realized. For over two centuries, I have watched it grow and blossom into something much, much more. The world is a different place now. But that ideal endures. A port after stormy seas. Snug Harbor is that port. Who am I? I am Captain Robert Richard Randall. And this is my legacy.